okay, folks? Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, good. We're going to start. Uh, some of you will have been lucky enough to get the special beer map. They're all secretly numbered, and of course there's a prize. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> we're talking about rediscovering lighting and I have here the most extraordinarily distinguished group, Jim Laws, who's been collecting ancient lights for more years than none, if any of us care to remember, uh, Rob Halliday, who's rather into the cutting edge of new stuff. Rob Bell, next to him, who's probably the most ingenious and brilliant lighting console programmer we've all met. And then young Neil Austin at the end, who's the busiest lighting designer in Britain, and we're pretty lucky to get him even for 10 minutes. Um, I'm chairing the thing, I'm going to start. The reason for my large picture on the wall is that this whole thing began only about six months ago where Rob Halliday wrote an article in uh, Light Sound International about Lightboard, which is something I had something to do with inventing years ago, and why was it better than some of the stuff that's been built since. And this stuff sparked a controversy because he wrote to Martin Moore, who is a maverick old gentleman um, who used to be chief engineer of strand lighting during the period where light board was invented and he wrote to an astonishing collection of ancient experts being engineers who worked for strand in the 60s and 70s and we've had this amazing correspondence of who designed that little bit and who designed that screw should go there so it's been pretty stimulating conversation. So that's where it all began. Then the idea grew that what was happening to all these old lights and all this old equipment, we were just going to throw it away. Well, thank God, Jim had saved like five barns full of stuff. And other people have been saving stuff for years. And we all got together and we came up with the idea Let's have a museum of theatre technology. Well, that lasted about a minute and a half, and then we decided, well, Britain can't even afford a theatre museum, so why should they have a museum for our old stuff? So we decided to create the Backstage Heritage Foundation, which is going to be a virtual museum. It's a website which is already up, thanks to John over here, and you will be able to find lots of old stuff on this website with photographs, descriptions, and who actually has what. Or who you might, if you wanted to find a pattern 27 from the 30s, so-and-so might have one, and you'd go and look at it. So this is like a massive club of people interested in all this old stuff. Rob will tell you more about it, we're all going to tell you more about it. So that's where it all began, and that's the reason for our session this afternoon. But then we thought, well, we can't, we, none of us really interested in that old stuff, well, except Jim. <laughs> um, and we'll the Let's talk about why are we interested in old stuff, and may it perhaps influence our ever-changing future. So that's what this afternoon's all about. Now you see, you'll be amazed here, I was young once. And this is me, age 14, and this is my instrument of choice, the Pattern 27, and I lit all the school plays with four of these as front of house lighting, which is very successful. But I was also a bit one for pushing the boat out, and I heard that Thorne had built a fluorescent lighting control system, and I had a sight full of it controlled by this thing at age 16. Then I sat and sort of fell into the profession, the new profession at the time of the lighting designer, and I had a model theater with which I persuaded people I could like their show, and since I was doing it for nothing, 
they didn't mind. <laughs> and the Pac-23 arrived. And these early shows were sort of interesting and got me name in the papers and led to my standing here, I suppose, as the geriatric oldest lighting designer in the world. <laughs> shows like Blitz, which was extraordinarily spectacular, and this is the show Martin Moore was actually the board operator on Blitz. We, we had a CD built specially for this show. I was then lucky enough to get busy and I assembled an amazing team of lighting designers. And there was a time in the 60s and 70s where we were lighting almost every show in London, it seemed. But it led to some amazing things. Lawrence Olivier hired me to be his lighting director at the National Theatre when it began, but the old Vic. And that allowed me to have built a special LP, which, because Tharista Dimmers had just been invented, and this is one with separate group switching on each preset, which made me have lots of rows with Fred Bentham, who didn't believe in that sort of thing. Uh, and it had one of the first stalls controls, and that's my old mate Robert Ormbo in the stalls, uh, from which he would like the whole show. Then Strand went, shall we say, gently into a decline. They tried to invent memory systems and failed. Uh, there was a bit of nepotism going on the management at the time, I believe. And so, as an th emerging theatre consultant, I was doing shows like, uh, theatres like Bristol and Sheffield, and I went to Thorne, and Thorne built a special cue file for the theatre, which had double playbacks, which allowed more flexible timing. Then I get appointed to the National, thanks to Sir Lawrence. And I suppose I was then, and maybe now, the only lighting designer to actually design his own lighting control system. And this is my first ever sketch for Lightboard, which gradually developed, with lots of other silly sketches, into the real thing. And these were installed in the National uh, and the Royal, uh, Royal Opera House, and there are about a dozen of them across Germany, in the Mark II version, which is the top right. So light control has always been my obsession. And I've been profoundly disappointed at how in the mid-70s, when you only worried about level, you could light fantastically quickly. You never needed a lighting rehearsal. You lit while the actors were rushing around the stage. Then moving lights came in, and everything ground to a halt. And everything seemed fantastically difficult and take forever. So I've been obsessed with how do you make it easier? How do you play lighting fluid, fluidly while the actors are on stage? And this was an early experiment. Fred Foster created the digital, digital what? Digitizer. A digitizer pad, which was a touch sensitive thing. I thought that's a sensitive way, sensible way to run lighting. Uh, and I did these silly sketches in the mid-90s about how you could have a surface which was touch sensitive and could give you all the subtlety of control that I'd developed with Lightboard, but also had built-in WYSIWYG and built-in whole hog touch selection of channels and groups and so on, and all sorts of stuff and color pickers and things like this. So this was a dream. I had the opportunity on Broadway a couple of times to introduce Whole Hog to Broadway, coupled with WYSIWYG, and that suddenly enabled you to work much faster than everyone else was able to. And then for a show in 2008, uh, I mixed WYSIWYG and Virtual Magic Sheet, which is my favorite piece of software. There's no better way of controlling lights because you know what you are doing instantly. And this is 1,600 channels on a screen this big, which you have instant access. So I was excited by all that stuff. So that's where we were 10 or 15 years ago. And now I'm going to move on to Jim, who's going to go back a bit into the past. Jim. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Or is it too much? Right, this is me in 1953 
with a, probably my first significant light. And it's a light over which I have totally no control, but it's marvellous. I want to show you how control developed. And there are elements of control that you may not even think are control. This is a church in Lincolnshire, only two months ago. And the guy there, the guy there is, ex is exercising local control. But you see the, li you see the lights uh, there? He's got a problem, because he can't reach those, so he goes for remote control. <laughs> um, now, the rest of the boards I'm going to show you, the rest of the lighting controls I'm going to show you are... Well, I'll start with one you wouldn't expect again. This is a, a gas control, this is a gas lighting control. And if you look carefully there, that is actually a preset. That's a, a bottom preset control. If you want to turn down gas, you don't want to turn it down too much or it goes out. So that just lets enough gas through. So that's quite an advanced control actually for 1900. This one's in my collection. As we go through now, I'm going to tell you where each one is. Then you can draw your conclusions about the vulnerability of controls. Controls, I may say, are trophy items. Um, in much of stage lighting, there are items which, are, which lie around and aren't big chunks, but everyone remembers their favorite control. And there are people who keep them in, in being. If you look carefully again, the mobile phone. This is taken 2012. 2012. It's a village hall in Wiltshire, and I've just supplied another five dimmers to bring up the bottom rank, so he's got a full collection. He's now got two broom handles worth of dimmers there, but the, the, the thing is he, the main thing is he has collected them, he's using them actively, and this is wonderful. This is sort of on the ethos of our collection. The next one is uh, one that some of you may well have used, the old temp board, and it's when you run out of pieces of wood, you can lock on You can lock on or lock off the handles on to the main shaft. Um, this one is used for recreations and it is with Ancient Lights Limited. And this one is lost. This is one of the first generation lighting controls from the West End. This is in the Albury Theatre and it was I think installed about 1900, probably taken out in the early 50s. So picture well all the first generation big lighting boards with their marble fronts are lost. We have to question that we want whether we want the, this to, to happen to the boards that are now still around. Here is um, a lighting board which is saved. This is the second generation, if you like, West End. This is the small grandmaster from the Duchess Theatre and it is at the Gaiety Theatre, Isle of Man, in the museum which is in their projection room. So that's safe along with quite a lot of other stuff and that's a good museum to visit. Its larger cousins, though, are there any of those left? Uh, there may be one at the Royal Court in Liverpool, I don't know. But there's not that many left. If anyone knows of any, do come and see us afterwards. And there is um, one of my lighting boards being used actively in a television production. This was the entertainer at BBC. So we made a mock-up control room that was the lighting board up there. Now this is a game changer. The guy on the right 
is Fred Bentham, and the lighting board in the middle is the light console for the Bristol LV. And, and that is the first Stalls plug-in control in the UK. Uh, it's a fairly hefty one. Um, hang on. Yes, right. Okay. Um, this one is saved at Rose Bruford College. And also, it's been given a second sort of life because there they have put a MIDI control on some of the um, the circuits, so actually it'll play on Thavis to Dimmers, and it's quite hard to work. This one is from the Festival Hall, and it's saved with DHA lighting, and they're looking after it very well, and they polished it up. This one is with Geriats in France, and it's from the Palace Manchester. And this one is at my own uh, my own barn store, Deva. On the left, we've got Lucian Nunes, who has a collection called uh, Electrokinetica, and he's a wizard with electromechanical memories. And then we've got John, who is Strand Archive, and when we looked at what our favourite things were, they're both headed for the Drury Lane light console, which is with me at the moment. This is the electronic, the Woods electronic board, which is running at the same time in production with Strand as the light consoles. The wonder of this one is there are two presets, one on the left, one on the right, and you can actually set an exact level for each of the dimmers twice, and then the big handles in the middle, you can crossfade between them. So that came from the, Pal the Manchester Opera House, and that's with me at the moment. And there is the valve bank, and John, uh, is weighing up how to photograph those valves. Three valves equals one dimmer. They work better in cool than they do in hot climates. <laughs> then Strand had a proliferation of lighting controls. The one which really cleaned up in the West End was System CD. And here is one. For the first time, you can combine the electromechanical steadiness with uh, exact presetting and that was why, despite its five-figure sum when people were only earning maybe £12 a week, um, the management insisted in having them. This one is with Lucian Nunes and Electro Connecticut at the moment. Uh, this is the memory bank for it, um, and this is Lucian explaining how the, how the bank worked. Um, he weighed it up and thought that to get the memory which is in your laptops, if you're using this sort of memory, you would need 700 container ships full of memory. So haven't we come a long way since uh, only the 60s? And this is the sort of dimmer bank that they drove. This is one little bit of the dimmer bank that they drove. It's basically like a grandmaster, but with no longer a man at the winding handle and at the lock-ons, but electro magnets and a five horsepower motor. And this is a plot sheet from uh, working a CD on one night stand from a guy called Mervyn Gould. Um, that means full up finish, and anything that hasn't got a level you can assume was at full. But that sort of playability is a playability that perhaps we all wish we could easily find in modern boards. This is Jane, Jane Thornton with her favourite board, which is also actually probably my favourite board. It's the PR72 from the Windsor Theatre Royal, uh, which we both worked in its heyday, which was from 1961 to when an MMS went in in the mid-1970s. No, you couldn't get a chase on those boards. Um, there are a few uh, a few Satchmore reactor boards preserved. Uh, I've got the one from the Albert Hall. What took over from all this was Francis, a Francis Reed inspired um, 
strand special for Glyndebourne, where you could have a stalls control and, and a stalls preset, so the lighting designer could set, sit next to the director and have absolute control. Then he could get the show plotted by the guy in the lighting box, and this is the, uh, the four preset master controlling with three groups, and this is the four presets being looked at by a large group of us that came to have a look at my collection over the summer. And this is my other favourite control room, the, um, it's the three set at the late lamented Farnham Redgrave, and there's another chief electrician here among us, or well, nearly so, aren't you Neil, from those days. Do you like the good luck cards? We really did a lavish job in those days, didn't we? Yeah. And this is a reminder that actually people were using manual boards not very long ago. This is the late lamented David Taylor with an AMC or Advanced, Man advanced Manual Control. And this is um, a picture of it in full, complete with the next sort of development, which was automation of crossfades. I never personally missed crossfades um, being done for me. I always liked to do my own profiling as we went, but nevertheless, Strand and others know best, I'm sure. So on the right, there's an extra panel for that. Um, but the future, it, uh, when first of all to uh, the multi-preset enormous boards as used by Queen. This is Jason Williams of Neat, the National Entertainment uh, ex en Exhibition of Entertainment Technology, which we've rescued some of this stuff from various garages around the United Kingdom. There's a lot more to rescue. It just shows the vulnerability of this kit that um, it has to be every now and again rescued and very carefully kept tabs on. And this is the real, piece, the, the real future. This is Rob with, a, with his favourite thing from uh, uh, my collection. Somehow, I don't think it'll be my favourite thing much longer. I think it's probably going to end up being um, one of Rob's uh, special things in his own special place. <laughs> um, well, can't you see? Look at that. I can't possibly be him, can I? It's someone else's turn now. This is my last slide. Okay. Rob, you're up. Let's have the future. Now. <laughs> That's one Rob, uh, and this is me. Um, this, this was Richard's idea of my slide. This is a, a book I wrote about people that write software in our lighting industry quite a while ago, and I was uh, lucky enough to have Richard actually write the foreword. Um, and uh, a lot of what we were uh, seeing on the slides prior were either fully mechanical, sometimes chemical, methods of controlling light, uh, and I've been asked to speak about how we do it with software. So even in the analog desks, like the QM500 that, that uh, I operated, funnily enough, at the beginning of my career, those sort of things were purely analog, and they did have some sequencing, but this was all done with analog circuitry and, and um, sample and hold and things like that. Um, now there were processors inside of these things and I'm just going to go over a little bit of the history and some of the watershed moments that, that changed uh, how we are actually controlling lights with computers nowadays. So I always like looking at the beginning of things and then where they go to and, and what happens in between. So somebody often has a great idea of how to employ technology to make it look pretty on stage for us and they will go into the garage and they will build a frightening sort of piece of kit like this and um, then more and more people will become aware of this technology being used in the theater and when I met Richard uh, in the late 90s he was working on the show called Showboat in Toronto and uh, wanted a lot of atmosphere as we often do in the theater but at that time, um, the health and safety around the fog machines wasn't very well documented, and in fact, probably quite bad for us. Um, so Equity, the, the actors and stage management union at the time, managed to petition the producers to have absolutely no atmosphere in the theater, and Richard had to light 
without it. But then advances of the technology came along and we have regulations and we have, so we've taken a technology that was interesting in the theater and we've improved upon it to the point where now we can do some pretty crazy things with, with smoke. Um, and that would just be one example. The other example that we've all been very, very keenly watching for the last eight or so years is we, for hundreds of years, since Gaslight and beyond, we've been using tungsten and we've become very familiar with the curves that tungsten has for us and, um, and, and quite comfortable in that scene. But then along came these guys and then we had to think about how we were going to control them. And funnily enough, mixing three or four or five or seven colors is not a trivial task. Um, but recently, Neil had just done Shakespeare in Love with Rob programming it, and they were given uh, the version two of the Source 4 LED. And it has reached a tipping point now where the two of them will profess that it is no longer a compromise to use this technology for some of the small benefits that this technology does. It is actually now uh, equal and in some cases better because of what the technology can do. And that comes not only from just people soldering stuff together, but from a lot of people thinking about algorithms and writing code and, uh, and, and the like. So in the early days of uh, control, we had a desk that looked very similar to this. We called this a piano board on Broadway. And for obvious reasons, it looks like a piano, an upright piano. And this could be operated by multiple people with sometimes multiple um, broom poles moving different faders uh, either at the same time or at different times. And it was a very, from the bums in seats, a very organic feel because one light would be moving at one rate and another light would be moving at another rate. And, and it just had that human feel to it. Then came along computers, and computers managed to just put numbers in slots. And a way of thinking about that would be this image where you basically have a address and a value inside of it. And in the very early days of computers, where memory was exceedingly expensive, and we saw the core memory pictures, um, and a lot of the earlier desks used that core memory, which is actually hand-wound magnets. Uh, they couldn't dynamically allocate memory. They had a very, very fixed amount of memory, and to do that, they couldn't waste time with having compilers and interpreters and all the rest of it. So these early guys were writing code that looked a lot like this assembly language stuff, and they were basically going uh, from one queue state to another queue state. So if you go back to the pigeonholes, they basically went from one image of this to another image of that. And that had its place. This desk is called the LS8. It was the first computerized desk used on Broadway. Not the first computerized desk in the world, but famously the first one used on Broadway for a chorus line. And uh, my prior boss, Gordon Perlman, was the guy who actually did all the assembly code to do that for the lighting designer, Theron Musser. Now, her spec for a chorus line was to have extreme repeatability, night after night, many, many lighting cues operating in near zero fade time. So, Gordon, with a static amount of memory, could say, right, here's a cue, and here's a cue. And how do we get from this queue to that queue? Well, we just read these new values and we put out the values to the memory. And that was great because now we had uh, extreme repeatability and, uh, and we could have many, many queues. It wasn't a matter of having to write this all down and then train operators, multiple operators to do it. You could do it with one guy hitting a button. And that was great, and the world took off with this thing called computers, and I'll just go back for a moment. And as the technology was introduced into the theater, we immediately see the benefits. But after a amount 
of time, it's like when the LEDs came in, we immediately saw saturated colors and quick color bumping and no gels and all the rest of it. But after an amount of time, you then start to see some of the shortcomings of this. And what we were finding is that that organic movement, that multiple fades happening at the same times, was very difficult to do when you had very, very small amounts of memory and very, very slow processors to work with. So with the advance of uh, better memories, uh, you know, what we now call RAM, uh, and better operating systems, kind of like Windows and earlier, um, and, uh, and better programming uh, philosophies like object-oriented programming and specifically C++, we could then ma manage the memory in this thing we call a stack and a heap. And this is pretty geeky stuff, but there's some very important things that came out of this dynamic memory management. And this was the ability on the fly to allocate more memory to a task and then maybe take it away as soon as you're done with it and use it again somewhere else. And what that allowed us to do is to go in many directions at the same time at different rates. And this, if I had a video of this, you guys have all seen the 3D pipes uh, animation as a screensaver. And that gives you a very different picture than a bunch of pigeonholes with static values in it. So, that led to more and more advances in lighting control. This is a snapshot from the Jans Vista, which took the idea of cue timing almost completely away and allowed almost every attribute of every light to be placed on a timeline and be stretched to where it is. And we're finally getting back with more advanced control systems like this um, EOS that is used uh, in the national. This is the, where is this picture taken, Rob? The national. Is it? Or English? Hands out there. Hands out there. She could tell us. But with systems like this, with oodles of RAM and oodles of memory and lots of horsepower, we can now do things that are starting to make the technology become transparent and bringing that human aspect back into it. And Richard is finally starting to get some of the tricks that he has been drawing in uh, paint for ages now, all on one desk. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. So the question is, in my mind, given that you can do all that, why do they still not feel like they're quite as good as they should be? And I say this as somebody who spends most of their life doing shows on lighting boards, as a line designer or as a programmer or whatever. Um, and the, part of the reason we got into this history thing is because looking back, you can see there's some things you could do on lighting desks from 20 years ago or 50 years ago that are strangely incredibly hard to do now. You know, running a queue manually, strangely, is very hard to do on a lot of modern lighting desks. Partly that's because nobody seems to want to do it anymore, but is it because they can't do it anymore? Are we now in a loop where functionality goes away because people don't have it, so they don't use it, so they don't have it? Um, because all we're trying to do in lighting, generally the way we work it now, is take, well it's complicated actually, because you're trying to take an idea that you have to express in one way, usually in some kind of lighting plan, and then translate it through language into a visual thing that you see on stage, which is incredibly hard to describe. And in fact, the process of lighting design, quite often the problem is the language. What words do you use to communicate what you're trying to get the thing to look like? And the interface between you and your thoughts and your words as the lighting designer is the plan. That tells people where you want to put the lights. Um, and then it's the control. It's how you control it, how you bring those lights up, the words you have to use to achieve what you're trying to get to on stage. Um, there are all kinds of games we play to help translate that into something that's a bit more manageable, whether it might be an American magic sheet or a list of channel numbers or something. The channel numbers are interesting because Richard has spent years saying channel numbers should go. Channel numbers are a bad thing that have no form of nature in lighting and nothing to do with what things look like and they should go away. Except that they're actually quite useful tools for when you have to communicate about which lights you want to turn on and off. Um, the Vista, which Bob's already referred to, is a brilliant, brilliant, really clever machine that almost nobody uses to do theatre shows. 
And the reason they don't is because the way we work with a lighting designer making the art and a programmer person dealing with the interface to the rig, the visual interface as they've done it doesn't work very well. The only way of bringing up a light is to say, um, you have to click on the touch screen and bring it up. If you say channel six at full, which is a shorthand of the way you've been thinking about that light, the operator has to go, uh, remind me again, where's channel six? Oh, okay, it's that blue one over there. I would imagine if you're working this machine yourself, it's amazing. But here we get into weird politics, which is now lighting designers generally in theatre won't work the machine. Some of that's because the machine isn't good enough. Mainly it's because as soon as you do that, in the minds of the director, you become a technician and not an artist. And from that moment on, they just treat you differently. So what you want is a natural interface between what you're thinking and what the light looks like on stage. What you want is the minority report thing that plugs into your brain and as you think of the state, it happens. Maybe what you want, this is uh, the light board of National in 1977 or something. David Hersey and his child, and um, my caption is, the child should be able to use the desk almost. Um, if you ever need this picture to uh, blackmail Alan Jacobi, who runs Unusual Rigging, that's him in the background. This is how I get stuff from Unusual Rigging, for a very good price. As you start looking at it, there's all kinds of things you could do with lighting control, but very quickly you start realizing that little tiny things actually count for a lot. I'm going to say right now, partly because there's a lynch mob out here, I can see in the middle. I'm going to sound like I'm knocking all kinds of things. I'm not, and I'm going to kind of sound like I'm using things as an example. I just used lots of screen grabs of the EOS because I have one and it was easy to get the screen grabs. Other products are just as good or just as bad in different ways. But as an example, when the EOS first came out, the number three looked like at the top, and when the EOS now, the number three looks like at the bottom. On the original version, it was really hard to tell what was a three and what was an eight and what was a nine. It sounds like an incredibly small detail, but when that's the information you're trying to pick up on 5,000 times in a day, that becomes incredibly important. Other people study this in detail. The signs at the top are America has redefined, redesigned the font it uses in road signs, which means you can read the same information from 500 feet further away more clearly. So for road safety, it's important. It's important for us as well. Little things, what's interesting is Rob talks about how dynamic memory and all the new super advanced software stuff has improved the way we interact with the equipment. And in many ways it has, but quite often you still end up with a screen full of channels. And you still end up going label text, 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 text. And you, and that somehow still doesn't feel right, because what you might want to do is describe that your lights are pointing like this. And the best way of doing that is to go like that. Or finally, for example, AVO would just let you draw labels instead of labeling labels. It's such a simple thing, but it makes such an enormous difference. This is my, I'm not saying all new technology is bad example, because I'm not. Um, this was a show we did a few years ago where we started using LEDs behind sites. And the amazing thing was now, you got away from the channel number interface because literally you could just draw on the screen and what you drew appeared on the sky, which is kind of remarkable. But all that technology should, I think, be used in a way to help us. And I'm just going to rattle through some examples now, which some people have heard before and some people haven't. But if it all sinks in and you go, yeah, that's a good idea, tell your manufacturer of choice and maybe we'll get them. The things like I realize as a programmer, as the interface between the designer and the rig, Quite often, what I'm dealing with are patterns of information. You know, if the designer says, what I need is channel one and three and seven, great. The next time they ask for that, what I do well is go, okay, you said one and, probably what you're gonna want is three and five. Why can't the machine do that for me? Your phone does it for you when you start typing a word. It finishes it for you now. Why can't the machine remember what you've been doing and offer it as suggestions? Um, why can't it present the information in a more helpful way? Now, there are other ways of doing this on consoles now, but if we look at a traditional channel screen, it's quite hard to figure out what all those things are. And what we all do is add patterns of our own to help us. So that block of channels, because it's a block, is probably one group of things, but that's a rule I've made for myself. You can select things easily. You can say, here are some groups. Groups are great. I can select groups. But what turns out to be interesting is making a show the first time is incredibly easy. 
coming back to edit the show a day later or a week later or a month later is incredibly hard. You have to go find the things you've used the first time again and reselect them because the machine doesn't tell you. And it should. And what's interesting is the light board in 1976 could. Whiteboard, if you made a queue using groups, when you remembered that queue, it remembered the groups. When you came back to edit the queue later, you didn't have to start the channels again. The machine said to you, this queue is made up of the psych, the cross light, the back light, and the front light. And then, because you had multiple wheels, you could then rebalance the look on stage and re-record it or whatever. The two key things there are, you could mix lighting. You could take lighting in your hands and you could manipulate it more than one thing at a time. Whereas all the current desks that have a channel wheel, one interface, let you manipulate things one at a time, and that somehow feels wrong. But also it remembered, so when you came back to edit it, the information was there for you without you having to find it. So this is like a mock-up. So if I select the downstairs right window group and I put it at 50%, say, why doesn't it show me right there in my selector that that group of things is at a level? So now I've got an overview of my look without having to deal with all those channels. Um, star, in my imagining, means that there's a range of levels. Why not present it like this? This is Lightboard. This is a knockoff of Lightboard from 30 years ago. And yet now these computers with infinitely more everything can't do this. They can't say to you, here are the building blocks you used to make your queue. Now manipulate them. And as soon as you do that, the need for all the magic sheets and the plans and the paperwork, once you've done the show once, sort of go away. Moving lights make it harder because what they can do and the group they can be in can change moment by moment by moment. So why not do this? And again, the manufacturers will say to you, well, you can do that now because you can go looking. You can say on a grandma, if red. On a EOS, you can say query red. It's all true, but you have to know what you're looking for. Did I call red, red, or did I call it Roscoe 26, or did I call it Lee 106? Here, the machine should present you with the information. You've already told it by putting the lights into that color. Now it should be able to present it back to you, I think. Interesting things, and this we don't even think about anymore because we're so used to a queue being a level and another queue being another level, and maybe the level tracks. But if you do the sequence on the left, you can think of it as the light comes to 30 and it goes to 50 and it goes to 60. What the lighting designer was probably actually thinking in their head was, the light comes on, the light gets brighter, the light gets brighter, the light gets brighter. They don't really care what the level is once they've started. What's important is the change. So at the moment, if you decide to change this sequence and you change the first cue, only the first cue changes, even in a tracking desk, because the level's always changing. So just as an idea, why not do this? Why not say what I care about is the relative level change? The computer doesn't care, it's all just numbers. But maybe that actually would better reflect the way we think. I might be wrong, but because I haven't had a console that lets me try it, I don't know. That's my old favorite desk still. Forgive my nostalgia, the old blue desk. But again, a lot of it is really just about how you present information. So here I can figure out the channel 48 is pointing at the pub table, the channel 50 is pointing at some other table. That's just because I've used presets in a way they were never designed to be used, just to label stuff. But why can't the machine flip that around for me? Why can't the machine do the looking up and say, these lights are doing something called pub, and these lights are doing something called table. And if you want a bit more detail, go hover over it, and it will give you more detail. Why can't it know, as I'm focusing a light, the other lights that are in a similar position will show me a little map? Why can't I say, take all these lights and all the positions are a bit out on tour, just move them all back by the same amount and then my refocus on tour is done. Why can't it spot patterns? Like in a show, we've ended up with these three focuses, three windows being an identical position by a half stance of the way we did the show. It's really hard for me to notice that, but the machine could notice that really easily. Actually understanding the structure of what we're talking about. The most interesting thing of Richard's slides was in the Lightboard 2000, there was the script in the lighting desk. And that sounds completely obvious, because then it could actually understand what the cues are relating to, rather than just being a series of numbers. Understanding the real world. So 
you've all done it, I'm sure, where you accidentally select one through 2,000 instead of one through two, and the entire building comes on to full. And if you're lucky, the mains doesn't trip out. And if you're unlucky, everyone's in the dark. Why can't the machine go? Uh, you, do, uh, you might not mean to put 6,000 amps on. Are you sure? Or why can't it, rather than us having to label every queue, why can't it figure out what we're doing based on the actions we've already done? Um, this is my favorite old new technology combination though. So this is WYSIWYG, or a visualization software of some kind. Probably WYSIWYG. And this is a very old lighting control. But the very cool thing is this has got, the, the screen at the front is a heads-up display like a teleprompter that they use to project information onto so that you can see the queue information while still seeing the stage, which I know some lighting designers don't like anymore. They like hiding behind all the monitors. But imagine if you could take that and line it up on that screen so it lined up with the stage. Now, you've got a lighting you can actually now directly manipulate. If that was a touch screen, you could directly select a light without worrying about what it was and manipulate it on the stage. That, I think, would be pretty cool. Neil. So, Neil, you're from the Take it to the edge. Well, Rob has sort of uh, stolen, stolen a lot of my thunder there because basically I want what Rob wants because that will stop him moaning in my ear the entire time. Um, I, I've, I've uh, got fed up with the amount of times he's frustrated with the technology getting in the way. And I get frustrated with that because I want the technology to be completely... I, I want the mind control version. I know what I want, but I can't say the words fast enough to get the information over to him, to many of you out there as well, apologies to all of you who have had to deal with me, um, and for you then to process that information and make it happen on stage. So I, I want that piece of technology to be seamless. And there are certain things in what you've all been talking about in, in, in the past that, that really spring to mind. The stalls control. Because the stalls control was in, was in the hands of lighting designers, it's not always uh, correct or the best method of working that the programmer has the control. There are certain times where it is a damn sight easier if I had a trackball or uh, two encoders, McGee at UM, um, to manipulate that light to the place that I want because the piece of furniture isn't there anymore and maybe you were looking down as a programmer when that piece of furniture was there. And you, so to try and describe in three dimensions, no, up a bit, left a bit, no, I'm talking about upstage and downstage, or am I talking about up and down from behind the light? It's, it becomes a disaster talking about lighting through a third party sometimes. Sometimes you want that control yourself. So maybe there's some, some part of it that at times you could say, hey, rest that piece of control over to me, please. I, I'd, I'd love to be able to position that light. And now, now you record it. Now you can carry on with the rest of it. I'm bored of that stuff. That, 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 that you can keep. Mixing color, the same thing, especially as we go into seven color LED units. It becomes very, very hard to talk through a third party about it. So maybe, maybe if I had the color picker, and I could just, yeah, a little bit more of that, a bit more of that. And then eventually when I get close enough and I get bored, I can hand it back to you again. So the stores control, I think, was a very, very interesting idea. I'm massively uh, up for relative values. I've just been through a, through a play at the Old Vic, uh, Electra. It's a Sophoclean unities of time and space so that it's, uh, it happens in two hours. I got bored of that. I decided I was going to do an entire sunrise through to sunset. And of course, that's all about relative values. And when you eventually go back to the beginning of the show and you decide that your first queue is actually a little bit dark and probably from the back of the stalls, everyone's struggling a bit, and you go, let's have everything just a little bit brighter, every other queue through that show is affected because of course now that six minute fade that goes into the dawn sunrise is not doing as much. So if they've been stored as relative values, that would have been a massive amount of work taken away from me. Of course, sometimes, that's maybe not what I wanted to do, but it would be great to have the choice of going, I'm making this change, remember that I was going at plus 10, at plus 20, at plus whatever it may be. Or the same with colour. Sometimes colour works the same. I'm going through a series of graduations of colours. Imagine the same thing again at sunrise. And if you suddenly decide that, as we did, that to go right the way through to a deep uh, red hue 
of Sunset at the very end of the show was slightly dramatic and maybe Kristen Scott Thomas deserves something slightly subtler. Then I've decided that the show only goes as far as this colour gamut by the end of it, so maybe if the desk could have fanned out and worked out what those colours were doing in between, maybe that technology could have, could have helped me. It's fine, there was more than enough time to do it, but there are, there are lessons maybe from the past that we could uh, use in the future. What else? I think, should we do questions? Perfect. Thank you, okay. Thanks, guys, that was, that was terrific. Uh, I just want to remind you about the Backstage Heritage Collection. We would like everyone to take a beer mat and join. Since we don't quite know yet what you would be joining, because we're just in the process of starting an organization, you just have to register your interest. Well, there's a fabulous website John Primrose is building, and we would love you all to be a part of it. Um, this is, oh, this is the website. And incidentally, this is not a national thing. Um, we're linking to websites around the world. At the beginning, there's the Strand Archive, which John has created, which if you don't know, you need to go look at, because it's a treasury of information. There's a lighting archive in New York, which is all about design. Now, there's some classic, brilliant designs, like legendary people like Jean Rosenthal are worth looking at. Germany has a museum, and we're going to link up with them. And there are others we found even today in Scandinavia and in Belgium, sites that we all need to know more about. The more we broaden our horizons, the better. And if you don't know, the uh, Arthur Lloyd collection about English theatre history is fascinating. Our website will take you to all these places and many more. So that's it. Now we're going to have discussion. We're almost out of time. So somebody would like to say something, please do speak. Is there a microphone or something? Yes, there is. So somebody say something and argue and say, what a load of old rubbish. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. <laughs> James Dutton, don't hide. Okay, somebody can go to see something. Oh, I see, I knew she had a question. Yeah. And why not say your name and then loudly ask the question? Hi, uh, my name's Rob, uh, and I'm a student, and um, I just had um, a question about just pulling on your, uh, your knowledge uh, about what you talked about quite, quite near the start. Um, I'm lighting a show soon uh, at, at uni in the age of gas and I'm trying to find somewhere where I can actually go and see gas lights lit with different fixtures so I can get a feel for it because actually it's very much about feel and, and I would really like to be able to do that. Could you offer some advice on where it's possible to go and do that? Jim? Uh, that, uh, hello. That's quite tricky because actually gas has changed since back in the day because it's now North Sea gas used to be coal gas. Uh, there's a gas museum at Fakenham, and, which is in Norfolk, um, and they actually make, make town gas. Uh, there are old fishermen who go out at night and they use a form of propane. Um, I would look at old paintings and see how paintings at the um, her paintings gave it. That'll be as near as you could. There's a very good one called Her First Bouquet by a guy called Charles Green. I'll give you that afterwards if you like. Uh, you can find that on the web, but beware, the colours on there can be pretty terrible depending on which print they've worked in. Yeah. There's also, there was a, unfortunately the gentleman's just died, he was 94 years old, there was a guy in Ealing who had a store, he, he restored pianolas and harmoniums, he was a wonderful eccentric, and his entire house was lit by gas, a mixture of gas chandeliers which were flame, and gas mantles in the kitchen and the toilet, and uh, he sort of run in and as you were uh, playing on one of the pianos and say, oh you're about to suffocate because the colour of the flame had changed and you'd throw the windows open. Um, unfortunately, uh, we're not quite sure what's going to happen to his house now he's died. But don't forget, uh, around the back of uh, Drury Lane, uh, there are still gas mantle, um, uh, gas mantle street lights and there are quite a lot of hotels now in the central London that have decided that uh, flame gas is uh, nice to have outside burning away. So, 
many opportunities there. And also, there's a firm called Suggs in Crawley who do, who still make make gas lighting equipment, and they're the ones who keep the Drury Lane stuff restored. Okay, thank you. Great question. Thank you. Somebody else. Somebody else. Oh yes, good. Round the front. Hi. Um, it was the, I think you're the lighting designer on the very end. Yes. You were saying occasionally you wished you had control. Yes. Have you not downloaded an app to your phone that can take over the desk? Uh, no, is there one? Tell me. Uh, <laughs> the, the ETC one, there I mentioned their name, is actually a free download and you can control any of their desks from an app. It even has the colour picker. Very good. Well, I should be doing that. <laughs> That's going to annoy the other guy theater. immensely. <laughs> Because well, I mean, yes. you just use it as a rigger remote, don't you? Yes, but that, I think I want slightly more... You can even record the cue from the app. Yes, yeah, I'm interested in that. What I'm interested in is the, is the immediate direct control of a colour picker that's large enough for a lighting designer to be interested in it. How, how, big, a, bigger, how big a tablet do you want? Yes, exactly. Obviously, if you get a bigger tablet, your colour picker becomes bigger. Yeah, quite. Okay, but here's just, just two examples. I'm not knocking anything you say. Two things. One is, all the colour pickers aren't very good. And the reason they're not very good is because if you want to make an adjustment to colour, if you st want to start in a colour and change the colour slightly, that's almost impossible to do because they're all absolute devices. If you put your finger on the thing, you've missed the colour. Yeah. So what you want is the thing that when you put your finger on the thing, the colour moves to where it is and then you can make an adjustment. The other thing about Tools for Light Designer is that the light board, which is one of the national, had a stalls control, which was designed just for the designer to be able to do exactly yeah. this, to potter around. But it could do really interesting things, because the designer could say things like, just store that for now. Not as a cue, not as anything, just store it in case it's useful. Or, I want to store that as Q10, but it's like an alternative version of Q10. So don't call it, and I don't want to get into have to call it Q910. <laughs> That's what we do, yeah. Yeah, but, but that's what I mean by the tools we use all the time yeah. that we invent yeah. games to yes. do. Given that we're all using them all the time and they're things we know we need to do all the time, surely there should be better provision, real provision, for doing them in the machine. Yeah. yeah. The same as the new EOS console now, obviously you can change your colour curve through your LED light, where we used to have to do maybe 10 or 12 cues to yeah. actually get it to pick oh, a specific yes. curve rather than what it naturally wanted to do to go from blue to green. Yeah. You can now go the route that you want to go. Yeah, that's the complications with subtle control of yeah. colour are absolutely mind-blowing. Yeah, but then, How do you get through any single path of the spectrum? And then a lot of people are putting their brains to that, or trying to put their brains to that. But was that not the same as we had in the old days with a four-colour psych, when we wanted to get from one colour to another, we could spend 20 minutes actually getting mm -hmm. what the lighting designer wanted. Apart from now, we've got a lot more LEDs, so we just have to do it yeah. times a lot more. Yeah. But I think yeah. Rob, Rob's point is, you know, the computers, I mean, this has a thousand times more memory than oh, yeah, light yeah. board had, but it, they don't do much more than remember where the lights are and what intensity they are. And they could do so much more. I mean, as Rob just said, light board, at the stall's control, you could re-record the cue, you could record the cue as a sort of scratch pad, and you could record the difference between what you have on your desk and the main desk. You yeah. know, there are all sorts of variations like yeah. that uh, you can't that, definitely do these days. And dare I say, in small theatres, that's actually why I like the element desk, because it has sliders. <laughs> And if you've only got 120 channels, them sliders, because you can just play with them, it's just a feel, and it's old-fashioned, and it's good. Yeah, the difference yeah. is, if you, if you put any of the, like, the classic desks that are in those pictures, the big rock and roll desks, yeah, yeah. and you put a child down in front of them, yeah. they will make stuff happen. Yes. And somehow, you add a layer of complication when you go to the interfaces we all now have, and there's all kinds of good reasons why those all happened. But it's just somehow we feel like we've lost some useful stuff. Yeah. And it's just how we get that back. And yeah, and the small desk, you can do that. But when you scale it up... Yeah. And the level of complications come from the sort of things we're trying to control from it now. And the fact that, as you say, we're not controlling just intensity. Yeah. Yeah. We're controlling multiple, multiple parameters. That's right. OK, we've got one minute. There's one more question. Anyone want... Anyone desperate to say something? Yes, somebody is. Oh, at the back. Uh, 
Hello, um, Dan from the National Theatre. It's actually just following on from that, and I, I just wanted to say a little bit more about, I, I actually think we're at a stage now, uh, agreeing with what you just said, that we're where we are because of the complexities of what we're controlling. But I think we're now at a stage where we can start handing back some things to the designer. And that might seem, as a programmer, quite a crazy thing to say. We're always gonna need programmers because what's at the end of the rig is so complicated. We now, I think, are at a stage where we have the tools to have things like colour controls. You know, we know, Neil, you and I, we can't talk about colour very easily. It's a hard thing to describe, especially when you've got seven colours. When you've got seven colours, is it, uh, do I want you to be giving me a bit more red or a little bit more of the red orange? Or actually, should I be using more of the Congo? Yes, exactly. Exactly. The, that, you know, the recording of it and handling that in the show file is a different matter. Yeah, of course. But allowing you to actually manipulate that, and it, it's much faster to do it as the person with the eyes trying to produce what you want. If, just, they're, if it, they're given the right tools to do it. Because some. Some of the complications of it now in, in the, the ETC series with the Celador, the seven channels, as a prime example. If you multiply 255 seven times, you get to 72 million billion color combinations. And it doesn't matter how good you think you are about adding a little bit more Congo, you're not going to be doing it as efficiently as an algorithm that is designed to do it to reach a metamer which is either the brightest or the most circadian light or the most color consistency or the best CRI. And these are these are the things that the engineers are now really starting to get our heads around. I mean, I was just, just, the one thing about that though is, the other thing that it feels to me like it was what happening is the, these programmer people, of which I am one, proudly, have just got in the way. You know, because what happens now is, what the lines are now, I'll say this example, you have a blue, big set of blue cross light and a big set of red cross light. And what the light designer wants to achieve is swapping the two colors over in the state. And that's quite a hard thing to do. It's like a three-step process of figuring out and selecting and applying and remembering and reselecting and reapplying. But that's what the line designer wants to do. And the programmer comes up with some super clever way of doing it. And then they think of a way that the, the desk might be able to help them do that a little bit better. And they tell that to the manufacturer. But what it feels like it's got lost in that conversation is the original intent, which was to swap these two colors. And yet that's what actually most people are trying to do most of the time, is things like that. And we just need to make sure that it's that message that's getting understood. Okay, guys, I think we come to the end. Does anyone on the platform want to say one last thing? Uh, uh, well, I'm going to say go look at the old strand lights because they're just beautiful objects that are on the strand stand. Yeah. Okay, I want to thank these guys and I will say once more we have this sense that from the past comes the future. And to support this new initiative, everybody, please, because we must be at a moment. They must soon have a new way of controlling lights, so we've all got to push them. And uh, from the past comes the future, so support this lot and design your own stuff and make it happen. Okay, thank you very much indeed.